Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome here today in this really very good summer's day. So it's great to see you all in here, which I think promises to be a very special occasion. Um, today, um, particularly happy to welcome Niall Dennehy and Joseph Thompson, who are the co-founders of AIDTech. Niall is going to give the presentation, but I believe Joseph is going to speak as well. <laughs> there, yeah. He's going to intervene now and no then. Um, they tell me they started their partnership back in um, 2006 in Ericsson's when they worked together. So they've a very long track record of working together. Although the company, it's quite amazing what has been achieved since 2014. So blockchain, every time we hear about blockchain, I suppose most of us kind of associate it with cryptocurrency, with Bitcoin. But today I think we're going to have another kind of look at what blockchain can do. And we're absolutely, I think, really pleased to have our co-founders here today and for Nile to speak about the company and what they have achieved and done. It's the first company in the world. Um, I think it was one of our t-shirts used to say, we were the best little country in the world, but this was the first company in the world to provide assistance to governments, international agencies like the UN, NGOs to deliver humanitarian aid using blockchain technology. But Niall will give examples which I think really caught the imagination of people where you can use blockchain to, as identifiers and for access for Syrian refugees. I think that actually people thought, isn't this an amazing achievement with all the problems in Syria that this could be done? But it really shows how blockchain can leverage the work of international organizations and how it contribute to the implementation of sustainable development goals. It is in many ways, I think, a disruptor. You're, you're changing really existing supply chains and business models in the global development sector. And there's no reason to see why this can't continue in other sectors. So I think what blockchain has done in this particular area has we discussed a little bit earlier over lunch, it's developed trust, it's developed a mechanism where when there are concerns about uh, where aid, donations, remittances are going uh, and they're lost for corruption or fraud, that there's a transparency offered by blockchain and it gives a considerable potential to provide solution to all these problems. But I said blockchain was the first company in the world to do these kind of things in, in development aid. But I'd have to say, and it'd be remiss for me to say this, I'm sure I don't know whether you're going to do it in your presentation, Neil, or Joe, but they've won enormous amount of awards. And these are not just simple awards. They have the IBM number one startup, global startup award in the year 2017, that's only last year, City Tech for Integrity Challenge, and the IMF's Global Changer, Game Changer Award. And these are all really amazing um, affirmation of the work they've done for such a young company. And they've also, I think, are the first company again in the world to receive investment from two governments, from the Irish government to um, Enterprise Ireland and the Singaporean government. So I'm really looking forward to your story, Neil, mm -hmm. and to hearing how things developed and how, what your view is for the future, and to jo Joseph's contribution as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Um, myself and my co-founder, Joe. Joe is the CEO of the company. I'm the, um, I'm the CEO. So what I'll do today is I'm going to take you on what I hope is an interesting journey. I'm going to talk about AIDTech, what we do. I'm going to try and demystify what blockchain is. Um, thanks again to Neil for setting up the, uh, the event today and the great intro there. Humbled, honoured to be here. We've ticked another list and now we can say we're the first blockchain company, or are we, to present them here? I have to say no. <laughs> but the first in global uh, development. First in, first in global development. We'll take that one. Look, that's something we'll go with. Um, but it's a pleasure to speak with you all. I'll take you on this journey. I'll demystify what blockchain is. But more importantly then, I'll try and give you some um, concrete, practical, tangible examples of what blockchain is, what it can do, how it can be deployed, how we've done it, what's the future of A-Tech, where are we going, and then we'll open it up to questions. So great to have your attention. 
So the, uh, what you see there on the uh, slide is empowering through transparency. That's really the mission of AidTech. And if you look at the connected dots, as you see them there, we believe that with exponential technologies like blockchain, like cryptocurrency, like artificial intelligence, when you can harness those, it's a big lofty ambition of ours to bring the world together. And we believe that blockchain fulfills a lot of the, uh, the trust that's missing between the different parties around the world. Um, but the mission of the company, we are a, a company driven by a social mission, but we are for profit. We're quite upfront about that. But the mission of the company is to bring social and financial inclusion to the undocumented, the underserved. We do that with blockchain technology and digital identity. And the reason that we do it is because every year, $4.4 trillion is lost or stolen because of fraud, corruption, and a lack of transparency. Um, speaking with development, we spoke uh, with uh, Ban Ki-moon, the former sec gen of the UN recently in New York, um, and he told us that every year 30% of international aid does go missing, according to him, according to the OECD, ODA, and that's something really that we thought we can play a role in helping solve. Uh, and one, one person who agreed with us, as you mentioned, was Madame Christine Lagarde, and again, a lot of it is down to the great work of Joe, if you're in making the connections. But we did win a big award last year at the IMF in Washington, D.C. And you'll see Christine Lagarde, and to her, her right then is a guy called James Wolfenson. And James is the former president of the World Bank for nine years. He's wrote a number of volumes about corruption, how to combat that. And in their eyes, in the eyes of Citibank and MasterCard, we are the number one company in the world using technology to fight corruption. That was an accolade that we got. Uh, we formed a very good partnership with Citi and MasterCard. And we won their company of the year last year as well. But again, that ties in with the mission of the company, what we're trying to do, where we're going, who we're working with. And I'll relate it all back to blockchain now very shortly. But the reason it happened really is down to my, my good friend and my co-founder, Joe, the real inspiration behind a tech. He gets a bit embarrassed any time I try and, and try and talk about him like this, but it's the truth. And a tech, as some of you may know already, it did happen almost by mistake, but it happened out of an experience that Joe had in the Moroccan desert in 2009, and he raised $122,000 for a charity in Africa for children suffering from facial disfiguration. <coughs> but somebody contacted Joe after and said, can you tell me where the money went? Long story short, we weren't able to give them the transparency that they needed, hence we thought if you can empower true transparency, back to the tagline, back to the mission of ATEC, then we can make a dent and we can start attacking this. But it wasn't until later Joe thought about that. He'll tell you more about the story himself. Um, but we thought that lingered for a while. And we thought, look, could we use this technology to and digital identity to make things like aid uh, transparent? So if you think about the different verticals that are out there today, you've got uh, clean tech, you've got health tech, you've got reg tech. We wanted to create a brand new industry and we wanted to call it aid tech to bring transparency to the delivery of aid. And we're very upfront about it. Part of the reason then that we did this was a very famous venture capitalist who goes by the name of Peter Thiel from Silicon Valley says, if you want to do something big, try and create a monopoly and try and do something that hasn't been done before and create a brand new industry. So as a result of the experience that Joe had in the desert, and we think that there's a bit of a growing trend right now at the moment that companies doing something in the social impact space up until now haven't been seen to be really viable, but we think that's changing. Um, we spoke about the third wave at lunchtime where we're now seeing startups. They're in the real world. They're doing real things. They're interacting with the world around us. Think Uber, think Airbnb. And it's physical, tangible things like healthcare, like aid that you can touch. And we believe that the blockchain is a way to do that. But I'll come back to Joe and he can tell you a little bit more later on. But first of all, then, we thought it might be a good idea to tell you a little bit about blockchain if you're not familiar with that already. And the thing about blockchain is a lot of people think that blockchain is the, is the missing piece of the internet. And the example that I would give is if you think about the internet to date, what it's done with voice, with video, and with data, think YouTube, think Skype, think WhatsApp, it's democratized the movement of text. So if I want to send a message from here all the way to Australia, I can do that within a fraction of a second with a free app that could be WhatsApp on my phone. And the only thing that I need to pay for is a 3G internet connection on my phone. It could be a broadband connection at home. Uh, if I want to send video anywhere in the world, I'm not reliant on a TV company like maybe a CNN to do that. I can go to YouTube, I can put up my video, I can share that with the world. And if I want to make a phone call now over the, over the internet, I can do that with Skype. So I don't need a telco company, although you might make the argument that they fulfill part of the role. 
But the only thing that really hasn't been democratized to date has been the movement of value across the internet. And that's really where blockchain came in in 2008. So if you think about the movement of value today, it's typically things like banks, like middlemen, insurance companies, they would control a lot of the movement of value. But when Bitcoin came along, probably the most well-known example of blockchain out there, it really started to, to democratize the movement of value. And we weren't reliant on banks, we weren't reliant on financial institutions to send something from point A to point B. And again, Joe met with these guys recently over in Geneva with uh, somebody who thinks that blockchain is going to be very big, is the World Economic Forum. And they think by the year 2027, blockchain is going to account for 10% of global GDP. That would be made up of things like cryptocurrencies, that's made up through inefficiencies that will happen, maybe the removal of uh, you know, some inefficient processes that take place right now. But we believe that will be exceeded. But what is blockchain? A good definition then is from the Bank of England. And the Bank of England would say that blockchain is a technology that allows people who don't know each other to trust a shared record of events. And the key word there, especially in relation to ATEC, is trust. So if you think about it then, what it means is everybody can verify that something happened in real time, everybody can collaborate to ensure that that did happen. And what it looks like technically, and this is about as technical as I will get, is you've got a block, the block is connected to another block with uh, this cryptographic chain. And on each uh, chain, then what you can do is you can store an event. And in the case of ATEC, and in the case of a lot of people, what they're doing is digital identity would be an example of an event that could be stored in the blockchain. It could be international aid, it could be remittances, it could be social welfare, and it could be donations. Now, what I'll do to back up this theory at the very start is I'll give you a practical, concrete, tangible examples of each one of these with the partners that we're working with and how we're solving them. But the key thing to remember here is that everything for us hinges on the idea of a digital identity. So giving somebody an identity on the web that they can take with them, that they own the data, the data is portable, that really is the mission. And we think then that by doing that, you're enabling people, you're giving them a data profile, a credit history, and they can be, go from being excluded to included. And one other final example would be, if you think about blockchain here really, it's a shared ledger. So the ledger then is distributed to all the participants in the network. They would use their computer, they validate the transactions, and thus they remove the need for a third party to intermediate. And one example would be here, this is one that I'd like to point out, is if you think about the financial crisis that we had back in 2008, a lot of people make the argument that blockchain and Bitcoin, etc., could have helped avert that. And the reason that they make that argument is, if you think about, to take some of the examples of the biggest banks in the US at the time, if you believe that they were the cause of a lot of the problems, but if Bank of America, if Citibank, if JP Morgan, if they were able to view a shared ledger and they knew who owed each other at what point in time, you can make the argument that we wouldn't have had this liquidity freeze up and credit crunch in the markets. So effectively, they would have viewed the same ledger and they can verify Citi would have been able to say to JP Morgan, I know that you owe me 10 billion, I owe you five, and they can do that. But instead, what happened was everything froze up because nobody trusted each other. And if you go back to the key word that I mentioned about trust, that really for us would be the key word that you think about when blockchain. Trust is the key thing. Um, so a bit of background about ATEC and in the development context, we're very much driven by these sustainable development goals. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here know what they are. 17 targets uh, set in association with the United Nations. We're very focused on some of them. And everything that we do, we look at the technology roadmap, we look at the business roadmap of ATEC, we literally, and this is the truth, we use them as a guiding force for every single thing that we do. Um, Joe mentioned at lunch, we get companies every day that are coming to us saying, can you do this, can you do that? And really, if something doesn't align with the mission that we're on, and it doesn't conform to one of these, we effectively turn them away. You might think that's a silly thing to do, but we really are a mission-driven company, and we would use these to guide the roadmap of the company. And if you're not sure what they are already, uh, we always try and publicize them. And again, I must say that Joe, my co-founder, it was only one of 10 people last year. He was named as the SDG pioneer for blockchain technology. Uh, one accolade you didn't mention, he was up in a billboard in Times Square next to the CEO of Total. And he even had his head put on M and M. So he technically oh, analyzed himself at the event. <laughs> the, the, the only one. The only one, yeah. So Joe is the SDG pioneer, so in the eyes of the UN, Joe is the man for blockchain technology, if I can put it like that, but have a look online.
Um, but basically what they are, they're a universal call to action to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Big, lofty, ambitious goals. But we believe, as I mentioned, with the technology as it is today, things like blockchain can really make a dent in these. And it's our job then to ensure that we live up to it. So a few of them then, to give you some context that we're really focused on, is, tar is goal number three, which is to promote good health. What I'll do there, I'll show you a project that we're doing on the ground right now in Tanzania with the Dutch NGO, and we're delivering medical entitlements to pregnant women. Another one would be reducing the cost of remittances, which is a huge market in association with the United Nations Development Program. And the other one then is to promote peace and justice. And we believe then that digital identity and to give identity to everybody in the world by the year 2030 is one goal that we can help achieve with this technology. And we truly believe that blockchain is the thing that can bind all of these together. If you want to take that analogy of the chain binding things together, it's not the only solution, it's part of the solution. It'll take working with people who've done, who've done this already. We know that we're really a tech company. That's the strength that we have. We don't have the program management, logistical background that NGOs, etc. have. So we know for us to achieve our mission, we need to partner with people like governments, with NGOs, with charities, and really hold hands with them to form that strong chain. Um, one goal, again, that we are really focused on is tar and the specific target would be target 16.9. And 16.9 is to bring legal identity to everybody in the world by the year 2030. And we believe then that blockchain technology is the way to do that. Uh, because right now, if you look at it, there are 2.4 billion people in the world today who lack any form of legal identity. Um, and I think we heard something last week came out that there are now, I believe, 68 million people in the world was the latest figure. Three million more than thought last, I think, for Refugee Week last year undocumented people in the world today in, in, in the form of migrants who've left. But there are a lot of people born around the world, like the women that I'll show you in the video very shortly, who haven't got any form of identity from day one. So we believe that we have the tool to bring identity to these people. That's Joe again. Uh, he is the, uh, the SDG pioneer for blockchain technology. Um, so he's quite famous in that space now. Yes. They invite him to events in New York at the That's UN all the time. He's asked to speak. Uh, so he, he does a lot of the talking going around the world. Um, but again, what we do is we use digital identity um, and we, we deliver entitlements transparently and efficiently. And effectively, we see that there are now 2.4 billion people. They haven't got any form of identity. And what it means is that they're excluded from services such as, but not limited to, remittances, welfare, aid, donations. Uh, a key one there is the ownership of data and another one is healthcare. But what we effectively do is we take real world entitlements that can be welfare, that can be remittances, that can be aid, that can be donations, that can be healthcare. And if you think of blockchain, if you look at the image there, you've got the funnel in the middle. Mm -hmm. Any of these can be tokenized, they can be digitized, and they can be converted into this digital asset, which can be moved from point A to point B, to point C, to point D, to point E, mm -hmm. and you can trace the movement of that data. I'll give you a very concrete, tangible example soon of what we did in Lebanon to how that's possible in the case of international aid. But in that case, we took money, we digitized it, we turned it into a cryptographic asset, and again, we put it on this ledger. And the thing to note then with blockchain and with the ledger is, the ledger, once entered to, can only be appended to. So with blockchain, mm -hmm. you cannot change the structure of the ledger. And that's where the whole idea of the trust comes in. Um, so to talk about the projects then, to give you some real world examples, uh, in relation to one target then, 16.9, which is to bring identity to everybody in the world. Uh, one thing that we did was we partnered with the International Federation of the Red Cross in Geneva. And here you see Gabriel Pictet from that institution. And what he's doing is creating and issuing digital identities on our platform. And in this project we did in Lebanon in 2015, you'll see Syrian refugees from the Akar refugee camp. And what they did here, there's Joe again, he's everywhere. They obtained goods from a supermarket in a completely transparent manner using that technology that you saw there. And that was the first time that blockchain technology had ever been used to deliver international aid. So what that meant is, if you are the Red Cross in Geneva, the, the International Federation, you give out aid to an aid worker on the ground. Or if you want to go directly to the refugee in that case, with the movement of this digital asset, which can be sent from one person to another, that then is appended to the ledger. You can see that Gabriel, who is on the video there, sent a digital asset, cryptographic asset, 
to uh, one of the refugees in the video there. And then you can see that this asset was used to obtain a product from a supermarket in that completely transparent manner. So that effectively means if you are a government, like the Irish government, and if you fund the Red Cross, if you fund another organisation, you can have permission to view the ledger. You may not see who the individual was, what their name was, but you will see that if money went in to the platform and it comes out at the other end, I can see what that money was spent on. So I can see that it was used for the correct purpose. And the interesting thing we found out about there was that the data that's generated in the background is actually highly valuable. And the one thing that we were told by the Red Cross when they did that, they said, look, we were able to get real-time information about what was being consumed on the ground in a previously impossible, well, not impossible, but a very hard place to reach. So when the refugee crisis hit Europe uh, back in 2015, we were told by them, look, we had sent container loads of goods out to people in places like Greece. We made the assumption about what they wanted. That could be water, that could be rice, that could be certain uh, products. But what they found out was that people pretty much had a plentiful supply of things like rice and water. But had they had this data at the time, which they have now, and I'll talk about Tanzania very shortly in the healthcare context, they would have been able to make better decisions about what the money was spent on at the very start because they had data on what was happening on the ground in a real location, in real time. And again, back to the idea of what blockchain brings is trust. You can trust the data on the blockchain because it cannot be overridden. That's really the innovation. And what we did was the NGO was the Red Cross, they used the platform, they transferred it over the, uh, the blockchain, it was received by the beneficiary, and that could be in the form of a plastic card, that could be in a mobile app. They used that then at the point of sale, they got the information from the merchant, mm -hmm. and the record was stored in the blockchain. And what we did there with that pilot back in 2015, we distributed 10,000 worth of aid, uh, we partnered with the local supermarket, we gave them each vouchers that had $20 worth of credit, so you could purchase anything that you wanted to the value of $20. It took about 10 minutes, you might have seen Joe in the video, again, mm -hmm. training the cashiers. We clocked it at about 8 minutes to get everybody up and running in the system, that was in the early days. Every voucher was redeemed, but the interesting thing that we found with that project that we didn't really anticipate was that a lot of the refugees uh, within hours, we had people come in and they had exact fake copies, replicas of the plastic card with the Red Cross logo, with a copied QR code, but when the merchant, the shopkeeper, scanned the QR code, it wasn't the same image of that individual. So when you scan with our technology, an image appears, then you put in a PIN code, and what we effectively proved that was that we could stop fraud in its tracks in that case. We're not claiming it's fraud proof. But that same shopkeeper told us about a project that he ran with a Scandinavian body beforehand. And he said that the refugees, when they came in uh, in the past, they were coming out fake paper copies of the vouchers. They had holograms on them, they had signatures, and in one instance, he gave out $6,000 worth of food to them, and it should have been 1500 So we proved that we could significantly reduce fraud at that stage using blockchain technology. And that's really where it took off. And even at that stage, we didn't really know that identity was the big, big, I guess, the killer application. Um, another one that we're doing right now is uh, on the ground in Tanzania. What we're doing there is we're using blockchain technology. And the mission here is within Target 3.2. We are, it's to end preventable deaths of newborns and to reduce mm. neonatal mortality. So the, w the women there that you see, she's one of the women from the project, we have issued them with a plastic card with a QR code. And what we're doing there is we're using the idea of a smart contract in the blockchain. And what the, cl the clinic that we're working with is they've defined what should a pregnant woman do throughout the journey of the pregnancy. There's prenatal care, there's postnatal care, there's antenatal care, there's certain types of drugs that they should get, like folic acid, mebendazole, etc. All of them things are sent as entitlements to their identity. So when they go to the clinic and the, the midwife looks at, the, um, at what's happening, she, he or she can see that they received the correct entitlements. And the most interesting thing happened only recently, and we're expecting the first baby to be born in the blockchain this week, believe it or not, and that baby will be linked to her mother's identity from day one. But we found from the data that's being generated there now on the ground that that clinic where those people, those women are receiving care, they've been lacking iron tablets, the hemoglobin machine for doing testing has been broken, and a drug called mebendazole wasn't being dispensed when it should be. So what happened really, and I was in Amsterdam last week with them, and the CEO of the company, Monique, was t telling a guy from the World Bank, this is revolutionary, like this genuinely, yeah. this is what she said, yeah. and they've issued a press release about it since. 
that we were able to tell that a remote clinic in a town called Kilwa, five hours north of Dar es Salaam, that it's lacking iron. So they made a decision within three hours that we need to get iron tablets to the clinic. And if you then think about the mission that we're on, Target 3.2, to reduce and prevent deaths of newborns, mm -hmm. we're not saying we're going to do that, but we're a big part of the process of helping to do that by ensuring that they get the correct entitlements. And if you contrast that then with the process that happened beforehand, there was a paper-based booklet written in Swahili that the doctor would physically mark with a pen and paper if they got their entitlements. Mm. And that would be sent to a data processing center in, in Dar es Salaam. And oftentimes, three months later, after the event happened, they would report on that. But if you think about it, the guy putting in the, the data, oftentimes it was strewn with errors. So the information that they got there, they couldn't rely on it to ensure that it is correct. Uh, another thing that we're doing as well is a platform called Trace Donate, and what this means is that if you, in the room here, as a donor, want to trace where your donation is going, what you can do is you can send that over the blockchain using identity, and you can get a report back to see where your donation was spent, yeah. what it was spent on, who spent it, and what it, I'll show you the video in a second, but that's the, the Farm Access project there. But this is the, the platform, so for example, I select my organization, I want to support Syrian refugees, I can see who they are. I make a donation then and I can specify what type of digital asset would be spent to the women or the people. It could be food, it could be medical kit, I enter my credit card details, I put in my, um, my CVC. And our model then is we take a fee on top of the donation amount, but we want to ensure that 100% of the donation goes to the, uh, the organisation and you can share that then with people at the very end. But really what you can do is you can make a donation to a group, you can make a donation to an appeal, which can be made up of, that could be the Syrian refugees that I spoke about. Mm. You can make a peer-to-peer -peer donation. So if you think about it, if you're giving somebody a digital identity and if they consent to show their information, to reveal who they are, you can now, as a donor, go directly from here in Dublin to somebody on the ground in, let's say, Lebanon. And then what you can do is you can see where it's going. So if you look carefully here, what we do with blockchain is, this is your impact report. You can see the assets, you've got food, you've got medical kit, you've got defibrillator, and I can see how much of my donation is spent. I can see what it was spent on. And if you squint a little bit then, what you can do is you can see there's an appeal, there's a group, there are the different groups, there are the people, and how much of your donation is spent in real time on the ground. So you get this complete instant impact report, seeing exactly where the money was going. And what it means then is for the organization, for the donor, for the, uh, the NGO, for the recipient, there's a fully traceable flow of information from the very start to the very finish. And if you go back again to what I spoke about trust, and what it means is not only can you tell where your donation was spent, but also by whom, for what, and how much. So if you think about the pregnant women that I spoke about in the video there, if you want to go directly to Adila and her new baby, Adila is the name of the mother we're expecting to give birth this week. If you want to go directly to her, Give her $5 to obtain baby powder from an approved merchant, you can do that. And what you do is you get an alert on your phone. If you think about it, you're on the couch in Dublin on a Friday night, you've made your donation on Monday, a dealer gets the powder on Friday, you get an alert to your mobile phone in the form of an SMS, or that could be an email, to say where it's been spent. And the thing that we're key to point out is information about a dealer is only revealed with her consent. And the way we think about data is that the data should be personal, it should be unique to her. It should be persistent, that it could stay with her from birth to death, and that can be portable. So if a dealer wants to take that to LinkedIn, to Twitter, whatever else down the line, when them services open up, she has complete ownership of that data. And then that will give her power over her data. And a bigger vision that we have is the data that's held by somebody like a dealer in the middle of Tanzania in a clinic. She then, rather than the model that we have right now with people like mm. Facebook and Google, where you've heard the cliche that you are the product, you effectively then can monetize your data if you want. You can use that data to build a profile. If you want to get insurance, if you want to get a bank account, if you want to be financially included, back to the mission of ATEC, if you want to be socially included, all the data that you have that's attached to your identity is at least a platform that you can build on top of and you can become financially included. And that's again why we think digital identity with the SDGs is a big one for us. Uh, another project that we're doing right now is in Jordan, we're sending out social welfare, that's with our partner in the United Nations Development Programme. Uh, and another one is remittances, so we, um, we're doing a project, that's us on the ground there with the UN in uh, Serbia, but one big target that we're working on, and this is something that we're really passionate about solving, is 
bringing the cost of remittances down. So if you know remittances, big market, $460 billion each year. The global average fee for sending remittances is about 7.42%. And the thing with remittances is the less developed the country, the higher the fees typically are. So if you take somewhere like Somalia, 90% of the economy there is based on remittances and the fees are typically anywhere between 15 and 20%. So if you think about the effect that that can have in a positive way in an economy, if you were to take that 15% back and pay a smaller fee, it means that, that that economy should thrive and that economy have a lot more money circulating. So we want to channel the money towards things like uh, utility bills, like gas, socially responsible um, mechanisms. And the goal of the, uh, the SDGs there is to bring remittance fees below 3% and to eliminate remittance corridors by below, above 5% by the year 2030. So we're doing that right now, and we're accelerating that by 12 years. So that's a goal of the UN. Mm -hmm. So that's a project that we've, uh, we've signed an MOU with them. We're gonna do it in 22 countries at a minimum before the end of the year. And that is uh, something we're excited about. A few more partners then that we work with. Uh, again, uh, you mentioned Enterprise Ireland. Uh, we recently got funding from EI. Uh, in the process became you know, the first company in the world to be backed by two governments, uh, SG Innovate, the investment arm of the Singapore government, uh, PwC, City, MasterCard, we work with people like the IFRC, the United Nations, MIT, uh, St. Vincent Paul, and we got funding from both the Rockefeller Foundation and Expo 2020. Um, here is Joe again, he is absolutely <laughs> everywhere, anywhere that he shows up, he tends to win something, uh, pure luck of the Irish. Uh, but a lot of hard graph behind it, but that was us recently in Dubai, winner of the Smart uh, Dubai Future blockchain. Yeah. We get a nice little check there, 20,000 USD. That was Joe up on stage. I think she's a, a princess from um, the UAE. Yeah, I wasn't a wash, uh, uh, um, hold her hand or shake her, her hand, so I was told. No, uh, no shaking of hands. No. We were named uh, MasterCard's company of the year in 2017. There's Joe up in what they call the Shark Tank over in Miami, but I think he. Um, he chewed up the judges anyway, and they did like the, the bait with you for that day. Uh, we were IBM's number one global startup in 2017, and only recently then we were delighted to announce that we were the first blockchain company in the world to receive investment and to be backed by both uh, two governments. And very proud to say, uh, and don't tell the Singaporeans, uh, probably prouder to be backed by our own government than we are with the Singaporeans, but <laughs> keep that secret and maybe chop that from the video. But delighted, delighted to be uh, backed by both of them. Uh, and again, some of the outlets that we've been featured in, so that's uh, ATEC, that's who, what we're doing, how we're doing it, uh, based here in Dublin. Um, we want to be based in Dublin for the foreseeable future. We've got an office in London, we've, uh, we're set up in the US and Delaware, but we really do see Dublin as the base for the company going forward. Um, mm -hmm. We're on a big recruitment drive at the moment, uh, we've got some really, really big things in the pipeline. But uh, we'd like to point out that we're one of the few companies in the world using blockchain right now for social impact. Uh, trying to do positive things, but at mm. the same time make a profit doing that. And we'd like to hope then mm. that eventually we become a template for a lot of people in the space to uh, feed off our, um, how will I put it then, our Come still, on. you know, the, the good work that we mm. hope we're doing. So that's it. Yeah. Any questions you've got then, uh, happy to answer. But thank you for your, yeah, your attention and the band. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. It's just an amazing story, and and I think the 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 fact that you're clearly driven by a mission and vision, and everything dictates that is is really I think uh, shows that it can be done in other sectors as well. But I think the work you're doing is amazing. But since Joe here. Um, has been mentioned so many times. I think we should ask you to speak, just in case sure. they feel that you're only pretty face, which of course not only is good true. <laughs> so well, I was just supposed to be here today, so I gay crashed my own company's presentation. So no, quite we were delighted. There, but, uh, the first thing I'd say on the SDGs, the 193 governments uh, have signed up for the Sustainable Development Goals. So from 2018, every government, every country in the world has been graded on their ability to attain the SDGs. So for me, it's a trillion dollar opportunity. It's a multi-billion mm. people problem. It's about a five trillion shortfall per year across all, company, uh, all governments. Um, so we're using the SDGs as, uh, as our business compass. It's a massive opportunity. Mm. And I, I think any corporate or any company that is not looking at this is just stupid, to be brutally honest. 
So by having those SDGs and by having these strategic partners, yeah. um, partners such as the UN, the Red Cross and, and governments and so on, um, are really our distribution networks. Uh, on the second point there, we just got invited to the Vatican, so we're actually at the Vatican oh. on Friday presenting on this. So Next you, Friday? No, just Friday oh, gone. Friday. Oh, okay. So yeah, so you have the Vatican now looking at this massively and, and the Vatican, um, you know, seeing that we're an Irish company and talk about the Pope's coming to Ireland and all this. So it was a real privilege to be there to, to speak about what we're doing, how it started in Ireland, and to get the attention of the IMF, the World Economic Forum, uh, mm. the Vatican. And because, you know, blockchain's fantastic, but I'd be the first to admit there's an awful lot of noise in this space. Mm. There's really a lot of noise in the blockchain space. Everything's blockchain is going to solve everything, mm. which it's not. So by having these very, very credible sources backing us, I think it looks great for Ireland mm. as a whole. Absolutely. I yeah. think it absolutely really does, um, and especially having conversations with the Europeans mm. and, and so on. So. There are just two things I'd add in there about kind of the partners, but the SDGs are so pivotally important going forward uh, and what that means for the size of the opportunity is absolutely massive in terms mm. of business because the more successful we become is because the more, the more people we have on our platform. Uh, so it's a win-win from a government's point of view because they have better targeting, better reporting, yeah. uh, and they can go back to taxpayers. We know where your money's gone. So we recently had dinner with the head of uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Development in, in the UK, Minister, Minister of State Penny Mothar, and she spends about 13 billion pounds every year on, on international aid and development. And you probably know the British media, if 50 pound goes missing somewhere where it shouldn't go, it's all over the media mm -hmm. over there. So they need to be more transparent than ever. Um, and they're looking at technologies to do this, which is absolutely fantastic, but also the British government. So last Wednesday night, we had a presentation meeting with the uh, borough of Newham in East London at the uh, London Stadium where West Ham play. So we had a big, we had 70 different councils from the UK there. So now we can see what we started off in aid, but we're going into, on the government side, onto welfare delivery, now to consumer sides, donations, and so on. So now you have the UK government looking at how can we use this to eliminate the four fraud. billion pound that fraud happens in the UK. So it's for us, it's, it's just nice to be in that position because they know, mm. again, they're being measured on, on the impact that they actually try to achieve. Mm. Um, so that's all I have to add there. And just Thank back you. to the, uh, the idea of uh, the Irish thing. Um, interestingly, we found that a lot of countries that we go to, including Tanzania recently, mm. uh, we often, people comment, oh, you're Irish. Oh, my yeah. teacher was from Irish that's growing right, up. But yeah. one of the, uh, the midwives that we met in Tanzania, She's like, oh yeah, do you know a place called Tralee? I'm like, well, I'm from Cork originally. Yeah, I think she was, yeah, my, my teacher was from Tralee. So we like to think that we're like modern, modern day missionaries. Yes, yeah. But instead of yeah. being driven by the Catholic Church, we're driven by this um, a social, social mission. Impact. So we're yeah. blockchain missionaries. Uh, yeah. So we like to think yeah. of it now at the it's moment. Nice, but yeah. it's funny, the Irish thing, uh, it doesn't do any harm when you're abroad to, yeah. to identify as a, an Irish company, even though technically we're a, a multinational. Mm -hmm. yeah.